Silence, please. I have prepared a special reward for you. The original ending to our little story is somewhat different than the one you have just experienced. If you can complete a final puzzle, childishly simple really, you will be able to learn the original solution to And Then There Were None, as Dame Agatha Christie first wrote it. Interested? Then your first step is to make your way to the dining room for a final treat. The Last Little Sailor Boy been spooled. I wonder what that was all about. Hmm, this is certainly a clue of some sort. From my earliest youth, I realized that my nature was a mass of contradictions. I have an incurably romantic imagination, and it was for this reason that I adopted a rather childish and unreliable approach, writing my confession, enclosing it in a bottle, and casting it into the waves. There is a hundred to one chance that this confession may be found, and then a hitherto unsolved murder mystery to be explained. Another trait born of my contradictory nature is my sadistic delight in causing death. From an early age, I knew very strongly the lust to kill. And yet, I was also indoctrinated with a strong sense of justice. I have always felt that the innocent should be spared and the guilty punished. With this mental makeup, it was inevitable that I would adopt the law as my profession. After ascending to the bench, I found that most of my baser desires were quenched in a legal and just way. And yet of late, I have felt a nagging urge, one that will not free me from its insistent grip. That is the urge to commit a murder myself. I fancied myself an artist in crime, and my imagination whacked secretly to this colossal force. However, I was restrained by my innate sense of justice. The innocent must not suffer. And then quite suddenly, the solution came to me. I would punish those that the law could not touch. In my years on the bench, there were many cases that frustrated my will, cases wherein I knew the accused to be guilty, and yet the evidence was such that he could never be convicted. Cases of deliberate murder that were quite untouchable within the confines of the law. So I determined to commit not just one murder, but murder on a grand scale. A childish rhyme of my infancy came back to me. The rhyme of the ten little sailor boys. Something about it fascinated me. The inexorable diminishment. The sense of inevitability. And so I began, secretly, to collect victims. 
I will not go into detail about how this was accomplished. Suffice to say, I was convinced of the guilt of every one of my victims, and I knew enough about them via my connections to be able to lure each one to Shipwreck Island with an appropriate bait. And now to the mechanics of the actual crime. In what I took as a sign, none of my plans misfired, and all of my guests arrived at Shipwreck Island on the 8th of August. The party included myself. The order of the deaths were dictated by what I viewed as my victims' varying degrees of guilt. Those whose guilt was lightest should go first and not suffer the increasing mental strain and fear reserved for the more cold-blooded offenders. The first death had already occurred. Archibald Morris, a shady little dope peddler, had set up the details for me, renting the island, sending the letters, and recording the gramophone record before I ended his life with a dose of potassium cyanide. Anthony Marsden and Mrs. Rogers died next, one instantaneously, the other in a peaceful sleep. Marsden's crime was one of circumstance and his amoral nature. Mrs. Rogers, I had no doubt, acted largely under the influence of her husband. Their murders were the easiest. Poison easily slipped into a glass for each of them, as at this point, no one had any reason to be suspicious. General Mackenzie met his death quite painlessly and never heard me approach. I am convinced that he was dead long before he ever came to Shipwreck Island. At this point, I found it necessary to recruit an ally. Dr. Armstrong seemed the most suited to this task, as it was inconceivable to him that a man of my standing could be a murderer. He was taken in with no resistance. I killed Rogers on the morning of the 10th. He too did not hear me approach. During the chaos arising from finding his body, I slipped into Lombard's room and abstracted his revolver. At breakfast, I slipped my last dose of poison into Miss Brent's coffee. It was enough to render her unconscious, and I returned a short time later to inject a strong dose of cyanide into her. It was just after this that I intimated to Armstrong that we must carry our plan into effect, that I must appear to be the next victim. This would, perhaps, rattle the murderer, and at any rate would allow me to move about the house and spy on whom I wished. A gunshot and some red mud on the forehead was all it took. After all, it was only Armstrong who examined me closely. After returning the revolver to Lombard's room, I had a rendezvous set up with Armstrong on the edge of a cliff. He was still quite unsuspicious, although he ought to have been warned by the nursery rhyme, a red herring swallowed one. Once at the cliff, I uttered an exclamation. Leaned over the cliff. Wasn't that the mouth of a cave? He leaned right over. A swift push sent him quickly into the heaving sea below. He took the red herring all right. And now came the moment I had anticipated. Three people who were so frightened of each other that anything might happen. And one of them had a revolver. I watched them from the windows of the house. When Bloor came up alone, I had the big marble clock poised ready. Exit Bloor. From my window, I saw Vera shoot Lombard. I always thought she was a match for him and more. I then immediately set the stage in her bedroom. It was an interesting experiment. Would the knowledge of her own guilt, the hypnotic suggestion of her surroundings, and the nervous tension of having just shot a man be enough to coerce her into taking her own life? It was. Vera Claythorne hanged herself before my very eyes as I stood in the shadow of the wardrobe. And now, 
I shall finish writing this. I shall enclose it and seal it in a bottle and throw the bottle into the sea. Why? Yes. Why? I suppose I have a pitiful human wish that someone should know just how clever I have been. I must go now and finish this. It is essential that my body be found in accordance with the record kept by my fellow victims. My own life is of no consequence. My doctors tell me I have a month to live at most. I do not wish to die the death of the invalid patient, steeped to the gills in drugs, culminating in a complete loss of human dignity. I will instead be found laid neatly in my bed, shot through the forehead. When the sea goes down, there will come from the mainland boats and men, and they will find ten dead bodies and an unsolved problem on Shipwreck Island. Signed, Lawrence Wargrave.